Aloha, brothers and sisters. Today, I have the privilege to introduce to you my husband and your president, John Tanner, as a man of character. I know many of you have heard him quote many times President David O. McKay saying that character is higher than intellect. John has a very keen intellect, but he also has a sterling character. Let me share just a few short examples that demonstrate his moral excellence. The day he proposed to me, I knew he was not only great, but also morally good. He promised me the truly important things in life. It was Easter Sunday. We were students in Provo at BYU, and he, I had invited him to come to my home in rural Salt Lake City for Easter dinner. So as we drove up the lane to my house, he drove past my house and went further to the, the dairy farm where I grew up. And he took me out to the haystacks and he proposed to me. And he was somewhat concerned because he felt he had decided that he was going to uh, enter a PhD program in English, and he was worried that there might not be any jobs at the end of the row, and he was worried about how he would support me in our lives. But he said, I promise you that no matter what kind of job I get, I will work hard, and you can count on me for that. But more importantly, he said, I want you to know and I promise you that I will always be faithful to the Lord, and I will always be faithful to you. Now those are the important things. Those are the things that someone of high moral character is concerned about and that a woman wants to hear, a woman I wanted to hear for my life. Early in the years of our marriage, he was true to those promises. We had four children before we finished graduate school, and he was working, going to school full time, a member of the bishopric, and supporting us as a family. He would come home at night after all those many things and read bedtime stories to the children and scrub the floor for me and teach me and tell me about his day. He was true to those promises that he had made. One of the part-time jobs that he sought and got when we were students was a gardening job. And he went for his first day of work and worked all day. The plants were healthy, and he asked the gardener at the end of the day what the crops were that he was growing. And among other things, the man said, I'm growing marijuana. And when John found that out, he said, oh, well, then I will no longer be able to work for you. And the man didn't complain, but he actually said, well, you've worked hard today. Let me pay you for your day's labor. And again, John felt like that was a conflict of interest to his principles and would not accept payment for that. Again, his principles were always at the forefront of everything that he did. One semester when he was teaching at BYU in, in a certain assignment, in a certain class, he had five students that plagiarized. And he was so dismayed by this because not only is this a violation of the honor code, but it's also a violation of God's law of honesty. And I was so impressed with the way he handled this. There were five of them, and in each case, he met with the individual. He helped them realize that they, there was a penalty to be paid for this dishonest act. But he worked with them and in different ways, according to their uh, infraction and according to their attitudes and according to their desire for repentance. And so the outcome for each individual was different and suited to their needs. And I remember at the time thinking how God-like that was, that, um, that God will use wisdom and caring and good judgment and, 
uh, helpfulness to each of us in our individual situations, which I saw again from John, this high moral excellence coming out in him. I believe that he began uh, to develop this character early in life, in his growing up years. He came from an excellent home. He had, there were 13 brothers and sisters, but his parents were very, um, uh, they were determined and they were very upfront about teaching moral principles. In fact, one of the maxims in his home growing up was, tanners are honest. And one time he was walking home from school with a couple of friends. One of them was kind of a delinquent boy. And he threw a bottle. Uh, they were walking over the freeway. He threw a bottle down and hit the windshield of a car on the freeway. It ended up that the police uh, men kind of traced him down. And when John got home, he got this kind of furtive call from this young man saying, John, you've got to lie for me. The police are here at my house. And it wasn't even a question. John said, I'm sorry, I, I can't lie for you. Tanners are honest. So he was developing this character, a great character early on. This university is being led by a man, not only of great intellect, but of great character. He is faithful to the Lord, to me, and to you, his university ohana. He is wise and caring. He uses good judgment. He works diligently. He has integrity to principles, lives with moral excellence, and is an example to us of what he preaches, being educated intellectually, but also morally, the education of the whole person. I love him, admire him, and appreciate him. And I always learn when he teaches. So now today, I am excited to learn along with you as President Tanner teaches us. What Susan didn't tell you about that one story was uh, that actually my dad was on the other end of the line when, I, when the, that phone call came. And I've often thought, how would have I felt if uh, I had agreed to lie and my father had known it? And that seemed to me a little parable because God's always on the other end of the line, and he knows all of our conversations. Our Father is always listening. Well, aloha. aloha. It's good to be with you. It's wonderful to be introduced by my, my, the love of my life, uh, my companion, Sister Tanner. They flashed up at the very end a little picture. That was when we were engaged. I know some of you may think, well, who's that? that <laughs> there's a funny story in Dandelion Wine, a, a novel that, where this, this uh, this uh, old lady, uh, or man, I can't remember now, I think it's a woman, has a, a picture when she was younger and there's a child that comes into her home and she says, that's me when I'm younger. And the woman says, the child says, no, it's not. You, didn't look, you don't look like that. <laughs> so you might have felt that way when you saw the picture. Who's that? <laughs> but it's actually us, Susan and I, uh, when we were younger and we were in love then and are even more in love now. I'm going to do something a little different today. I'm, I'm going to talk to you and teach you without, without uh, a written talk. Uh, I want to just introduce my theme, uh, what, what I'd like to talk to you about today. Uh, it, it flows from our conversation when we had that panel here a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago now, with uh, the, the brethren and sister, and sister, sister Bingham as well. Uh, but uh, Elder Holland asked me at that in that panel to take the questions that you wrote that regarded morality and worthiness. And I gave a, a, an answer and he suggested that I continue to talk to you and follow up on that. And so I want to do that today and I want to do that more in the spirit of the panel where I just want to talk about this. But So I'm going to talk today about the, the questions you wrote, remember, dealt with pornography, it dealt with uh, sexual stimulation, and it dealt with what I call addictive behaviors. and not only in yourselves, but in sometimes in your loved ones. Those were the questions we got. And specifically, you also felt that you were struggling to feel hope that this could ever, you could ever be better, or that your loved one could ever be better. So I want to talk today about sin, and about sinfulness, and about hope, and specifically about hope in the Savior, hope in Christ. <clears throat> so, 
This is a this is going to be interesting for me to just to just teach this for a little while with you, but um, as I thought about that structure of the or how I wanted to organize it, we're going to talk about sin first, and then talk about what I call sinfulness, and that leads to sometimes despair, and then I want to talk about hope, and particularly the hope in Christ, that brightness of hope we can have. So, in that journey from darkness, the dark kind of conversations about sin, uh, I, I was reminded that this, this sort of, this, a journey, this journey is one that reminds me of some literature that I love. Uh, one of them is Dante's uh, great epic, which starts with the Inferno and ends with Paradiso. It ends with, starts with hell and ends with heaven. And similarly, John Milton, a poet that I've read and studied a lot and taught a lot, has the same sort of uh, movement in his poem. He, he begins the poem with a vision of, of Satan suffering in hell, and then it moves toward heaven afterward. And so we're going to move from darkness to light in, in the conversation I'd like to have with you today. But we have to face the darkness uh, in order to really understand the hope and the light that we have in Christ. We really have to understand that. Um, and and um, we're also going to talk a little bit about despair, and both, both uh, um, Dante and Milton define that hopelessness as the essence of hell, and anyone who has struggled with this will understand. Dante famously has at the gates of his inferno, abandon all hope, all ye that enter here. Hell is by definition for Dante a place without hope. Uh, Milton has something very similar. Uh, when he first describes his hell, he says it's a place where hope never comes. But he's even more interesting and psychological in this. Uh, he shows Satan moving outside the physical confines of hell, but bringing uh, that despairing personality with him. So Satan once says, Oh, wretched man, me, which, which way I fly, infinite, infinite misery, infinite despair. Myself, and I'm, I'm not in hell, but myself am hell. So I want to face that first. Like Jacob, it's a little hard to talk about sin, a little hard to talk about these things, the dark things, but it's important. The first thing I want to say about, about the questions we got when you're struggling with with, sin, with, with certain sins, whether they're sexual or other sins, and I sense that there are many in the congregation and in the campus who do struggle with these, is you need to understand first that we all are sinners. We all sin. In Romans, it's, Paul is quite clear about this. He says, it's, all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. And something very similar is said in section 82 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where, where it says that we are we are all struggling with sin. Let me just see if I can find this real quickly. Um, verse 6. And it says, and, and the anger of God is kindled against the inhabitants of the earth, and none doeth good, for all have gone out of the way. So this isn't just in Paul, in the New Testament. It's also in the, it's in the modern revelation. In the church, we're uncomfortable with talking about this. In fact, it's interesting to me that when we talk about sin, we normally don't call sin sin. We're, we're much more inclined to use euphemisms. I've heard us say, forgive us for our weaknesses. You've heard the same thing. Or forgive us for our shortcomings. It's as if we don't want to name the thing sin. I would say we need to be strengthened in our weaknesses, and we need to be we need to be helped in our shortcomings, but what we really, what we really need forgiveness for is our sins. And sometimes we'll use transgressions, but it's almost as if we don't even want to talk about the word because it has that dark coloring to it. But so the first thing to remember is that um, we've all sinned. We all sin. We're, we, we all need to repent. And repentance sometimes for us, we also think of that as kind of a, a negative word, but in fact, repentance is the essence of the gospel. It says, this is the gospel of repentance. You've heard that many times. It's the good news is that we can repent. 
The gospel's good news is that we can repent and be forgiven. It's a blessing. It's a great thing to be able to have that privilege. And in order for us to know that we need to repent, we have to identify that we have things that we need to repent of. And so, and so now, for some of us, we need to keep a balanced view of this. There, I, I have seen that people kind of err, err, err on the side of both sides of this. For some people, um, they're a little casual. And instead of thinking, they, they may think that, you know, it's sort of like, well, it's the Book of Mormon scripture. Let me just uh, turn to this because you, you'll recognize this quickly. Uh, the way they approach, uh, approach uh, transgression might be a little bit like this. It says, and there are many that, many that say, eat, drink, and be merry, nevertheless fear God, and he will justify in committing a little sin. Yea, lie a little, and take advantage of one because of his words. Dig a pit for your neighbor, for thy neighbor, for there is no harm in this. Do all these things, for tomorrow we die. And if it be that we are guilty, God will beat us with a few stripes, and at last we shall be saved in the kingdom of God. There are some who minimize this and feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm fine, and don't really confront that, their, their transgressions. And there are others, however, who have the opposite problem. And a lot of those, you may find yourself in this situation. It's kind of the spiritual perfectionists among us. And we beat ourselves up when we, because we feel like we are, we are all we are is, is, is always, we're, we're just making mistakes. We define ourselves by our mistakes. One time a friend of mine gave, my, gave me a little cartoon, which I was going to show, but I won't because it's copyrighted. But it shows this kind of balding old man arriving at the, at, at, in heaven at Peter's gate and and Peter says to him, a friend of mine gave this to me who also is like this. He said, no, the, Peter says, no, no, that wasn't a sin either. Why, you must have just worried yourself to death. <laughs> so there are also those who, who, who are just preoccupied and feel like everything. So between those extremes, there's a right balance to have about how we look on this. And some of it is that we need to negotiate the gospel message, which is the gospel is to uh, comfort the uncomfortable uh, or uh, comfort the afflicted and afflict uh, the comforted. Uh, that's a, to paraphrase something that once they said about newspaper reporters. I used to say it this way. I'd say the gospel is for those that has a message for those who fear to fear not and for those who fear not to fear. In some ways you can never get it right. But it is, to, it, it is a message of hope, but it's also a message of the a conviction that we need, we're in a, we're, we, we, need, we need help because none of us are perfect. All have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. Now, um, but there's something deeper than in our individual sins that we often don't talk about too much in the church. It's all over the scriptures, especially the Book of Mormon. And it is what I call sinfulness, or it is the bondage of sin. The, it is sin as repeated, or repeated actions, not just an individual once, once, once in a while transgression. It's the feeling of being chained by sin, as the Book of Mormon uses that over and over again. Um, you see this in something like you asked about, the pornography. Pornography can be very addictive, and there are many people that f feel trapped by that sin. It's not just one sin, in other words. It's the sense of, uh, the fact of being sinful, of continuing to. Self-abuse, which was also asked about sexual self-abuse or masturbation, was a question that came to us. Drug abuse, alcohol abuse, sometimes violence and anger the way we, we, we interact and, uh, can be this way. These are part of some of the ways that we experience sin as change, as chains, as a bondage, as a captivity. It goes beyond just a single sin and it's, it has to do with our sense of being trapped in a cycle of sin. And I think if you haven't felt this you probably will at some point, but if you haven't felt this, a good analogy for me is, is, is the need to diet or exercise. Some of you will find yourself uh, 
always needing to lose the same five pounds or 10 pounds. You're kind of trapped in this cycle and you, you, know, you, you eat and you kind of hate yourself while you're eating that brownie. That's, that's the experience that Paul and Moroni and, well, and Nephi and others that I talk about. I want to talk to you about this. It's, there's a sense in the scriptures say that our old, when we transgress again, we feel the burden of the old sins returning and that weight of sinfulness. Um, Paul and Nephi talk about this, uh, Paul in Romans, uh, where he says that that which I do, I would not do. And that which I would not do, I do. Now, Joseph Smith has a different translation. I'm just going with the King James right now. Uh, he says, that I, and I hate myself for doing the things that I don't like to do. Can you see yourself again kind of eating the, eating, breaking your diet? And you know you don't want to do that, but you kind of do it anyway. That divided person, there's actually a, a fancy psychological term for this, or, or Latin term for this. It's called dipsychia, or I guess it'd be Greek. It's two of two souls or two wills, the divided self. And Paul talks about that. And finally he says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of death? How can I get over this? Now, I think he's talking not just about himself, but about those of us that feel captivated or in bondage to our sinfulness, our transgressions. He's at war with himself. His spirit and flesh seem, seem divided. I've talked to people who have struggled with pornography who have felt the same way. They're so ashamed. They're so difficult. I mean, they almost want to tear out their eyes because they feel at war with themselves. And other kinds of transgression. I've dealt with people who are, struggle with alcohol abuse or do something, and they just feel horrible after they do it. Um, this is the nature of when we're dealing not just with individual sins, but with the transgressions, with our and Nephi has the same thing. He says that he felt encompassed in Nephi's psalm, which we'll talk about quite a bit today, Nephi's psalm in 2 Nephi chapter 4. He says he feels encompassed about by the temptations and sins which do so easily beset me. It's interesting that Nephi would say. And it's, it feels to me, at least as I read Nephi's psalms, that one of those might be anger. He talks quite a bit about being angry with his brethren. Well, they want to kill him. But Nephi knows that he's responding in a way that maybe he's letting the natural man take hold of him. And he wonders what he can do about this. Now, I love Nephi's psalm because it, it comes in a remarkable place in the Book of Mormon. It comes right after Nephi's father, Lehi, dies. He's alone. And he's got fratricidal brothers who want to kill him. And he's trying to hold this community together. And where does he turn? Maybe he would have talked to his father, but now he turns to writing. And he talks about his own internal struggles in a way we haven't seen with Nephi and never do quite in the same way again. And he says, so why should I yield because of my flesh? Why should I give way to temptation? And then in the same language as Paul, he says, oh, wretched man that I am. This sense of being in bondage, trapped to sin. So, what is the solution to both sin and sinfulness? It is found in the atonement of Jesus Christ. Paul, just, just let me finish with Paul, because that may be less familiar than, than Nephi. Uh, this is in chapter 7 of, of Romans. He says after that, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So with this mind I serve the law of God. The, the, he, turns immediate, he turns to Christ, and of course, so does Nephi. This, the, 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 the solution for both sin is the forgiveness that we can have through the atonement. And for sinfulness, it's the possibility that we have of through the atonement of becoming new, of having our sins forgiven and our hearts renewed and changed and actually empowered to overcome and be liberated. That's where the scriptures talk about Christ is setting us free 
not just forgiving, but enabling us to free ourselves from the chains and the bondage of, of sinfulness. The atonement forgives us for our sins. It also offers another image that the scriptures use is the healing for our sinfulness. Now, that possibility of being forgiven and being healed is what gives us hope in Christ and in his atonement. And the great message of the gospel is that we really do have this hope. Christ offers hope. Hope is a key gospel virtue. It is found, of course, we hear of it in the uh, faith, hope, and charity. But it seemed to me that of that triad, that magnificent triad, faith, hope, and charity, we talk a lot more about faith and a lot more about charity, and hope gets kind of neglected. But it is this core virtue. In fact, one time when a, one of the general authorities was eating out at a restaurant, it was a Greek restaurant, and his wife looked dark hair, she kind of looked grief, Greek, um, the restaurateur came up and he had suffered through World War II and he, he said, you're so beautiful, your wife is so beautiful that if you answer this question right, I'll give you a free meal. And this was Elder Tuttle and his wife and he was a dear friend of Elder Packer who told this story to me. And Elder Packer says that, El that, that, that the Tuttle said, well, what's, the, the, the man said, so what is the greatest thing? What's the thing that, you, that humans most need in this life? And the Tuttle said, love. And the, the Greek restaurateur said, no, love isn't the most important thing. You can live without love. What you most need is hope. What you need is the sense that hope, of hope that things can get better. It's this virtue then in this triad of virtues that sometimes gets neglected in my view anyway. In fact, if you look at the Bible dictionary, it's interesting in our Bible dictionary based on the Cambridge Bible, but it doesn't even have an entry for hope. It has one for faith, it has one for charity. It seems neglected in the lexicon of our lives somewhat too. Partly because it gets, it gets confused. It gets, it gets confounded or conflated with, with, with faith in particular. And they are very much alike. I call them siblings. They're near twins. They're, they're, they a lot, sort of look alike and they're interrelated. Uh, they're, one, one person once said they're good friends faith, hope, and charity. In Moroni 7, they're, they're interrelated. Sometimes they're, they're sequential in different ways. But faith and hope are somewhat different as two. And the way I can see, I see this difference most quickly is by their opposite. The opposite of faith is doubt. What is the opposite of hope? Well, it would be hopelessness. And the, the, la, the, the word for that is despair. You can feel, those of you that know romance language, there's the word esperance or, or esperanza or es, uh, to, to hope in there. And to be without, to, to not have hope, it's not just to, that you don't have hope, it's that you set yourself against hope. One of the reasons that some Christian traditions have thought of despair as a, itself a sin is because it denies the atonement of Jesus Christ. It says, to be in despair says, I not only don't believe, I do not believe that Christ can change me, that Christ can offer me something and that I can be anything other than I am in my wicked self, the natural man. So that's a very darker thing than discouragement. It's related to that. And then, and then even then, uh, then um, uh, depression, though it's related to depression. To be in despair is to set yourself up against hope, to say it can never be different. Moroni says that despair comes from iniquity, and it's truly wound up in our sin and our sinfulness, the sense that we can never be better. So faith is different, a little bit different than, I mean, Despair, uh, hope and faith are a little bit different. Another way that you can think of the difference is that faith is, can be somewhat more impersonal. You can have faith that the church is true. You can have faith that the prophet, God lives and the prophet is, is a prophet. Hope is a little more personal. It's about how the gospel applies to your life and to your loved ones. Do you have hope that you can be forgiven? 
Do you have hope that you can be better? Do you have hope that your somebody can be healed? You or your family. It's a very personal rather than, and, and faith can be personal, but it can be impersonal as well. It can be propositional, I would say. Faith can apply to the past, present, and future. You can have faith that something happened in the past. You don't have hope that something happened in the past so much. You should have faith in that. Hope is really future-oriented. Hope is oriented to the dawn, to the prospect of things sometimes being better and brighter. Faith is only a noun, whereas hope is a noun and a virtue. It's, it's an active looking forward to, to, into the future with uh, eager expectation. Well, I better hurry on here. So the other problem with, faith, with hope is it's a, it, there's a, a mundane use of hope. I hope it rains. I hope I get an A. I hope that is mundane hope. That is secular. That's just regular hope. Hope in Christ is something different. Neil Maxwell called that one kind of hope proximate hopes. It's plural. We have hopes in this and that and the other. Hope in Christ is about the atonement. In fact, I love this scripture in, uh, in Moroni 7 where it says, what shall we hope for? What shall we hope for? Behold, I say unto you, you shall have hope through the atonement of Christ and the power of his resurrection to be raised unto life eternal. And this because of the faith that you have as well, according to the promise. There is one hope and it is hope in salvation, hope that Christ will reach into our lives and save us and fix whatever is broken and heal whatever needs to be healed. And whether in this life or eternity, that's where our hope lies. Hope is not really quite optimism either. I won't go into this, but optimism uh, is a little different than hope. Hope is, 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 is a little even different in color than that, than optimism. So, now... When we fall into transgression, especially repeated transgression, we usually have to fight two enemies, two battles. One of them is the battle with the particular transgression. You know, I'm not going to eat that, break my diet, got to resist that. But the other one is the battle to give up, to give in to hopelessness. Satan wants to win both battles, but the one is just a skirmish. If he gets you to transgress, if he gets you to do something you, you know you shouldn't do once, he's gotten you to do that once. He's won the skirmish. He hasn't won the warfare. When he gets you to, to become habitually transgress in one way or another, say you habitually um, break the law of... Uh, of chastity by, by violating pornography, then he's got, he's got a deeper hook in you. But what he also wants to do is get you to lose the battle of hope, to give up, to become hopeless, to give in to despair. That then he's won the war for your soul. So he doesn't want to just win the skirmish, the, the specific sin. And he even doesn't want to just get you to feel like you're, to get you in the habit of sinning. He wants you to give up. That's where despair comes in. How do we overcome that? We have to be clear about this, brothers and sisters. We have to realize that we need to cling to hope. Hope cometh from iniquity, despair cometh from Christ. I mean, uh, hope, despair cometh from iniquity, hope cometh from Christ, that anchor. Uh, quickly, I'm going to go through a few ways that we can do this from the Psalm of Nephi. The Psalm of Nephi gave, gives, for me, some ways that we can, oh, we can face this giant despair. Nephi says, prays, let me shake at the very appearance of sin. If you're struggling with, with some kind, these kinds of transgressions, note the beginning of the temptation. Note what leads up to it. You have to open the fridge before you eat the chocolate cake. Note what you do that leads to sin. Don't go into the bar if you're an alcoholic. Don't browse the computer alone in your room or surf channels in TV in a motel room if you know that this is what you struggle with. 
Shake at the very appearance of sin, as Nephi says in his psalm. Oh, let me shake at the very appearance of sin. And then Nephi says, let me be strict on the plain road. Develop strictness in your life, a discipline. Do it in small things. The secret is just taking small things. Sometimes if you get up in the morning, if you read your scriptures, if you just follow the routine that you've promised yourself you'd follow in those small things, it may have nothing to do with your sin. You develop a discipline that will allow you to overcome the temptations. Nephi cries out, awake my soul, no longer droop in sin. That's the third thing you can do. Get up, awake, get out of the situation, get going, pick yourself up from the floor in your wallowing with self-pity. Get going, awake, spiritually. Go take a cold shower. Change your circumstances. And then I would add another one. Let the light in. Nephi confesses to us his problems. Find some people that can support you. Um, it could be your parents. It could be your spouse if you're struggling. We want to keep our sins to ourselves, and we should in most ways, but there are some people we can, that can help us in our journey. Certainly our spouses, our parents, the bishop, and the Lord. You can do like Nephi is doing, and let the light shine in. And finally, take advantage of covenants. This doesn't come out quite as much in Nephi's psalm, but especially the sacrament. It's the only covenant we make for ourselves repeatedly. Go to the sacrament table and make that covenants so you can more fully keep yourself unspotted from the world. The sacrament isn't just a renewal of old covenants. 3 Nephi 18 it says it's a testimony of our commitment to Christ. Notice how many present tense verbs I do always remember. When I take the bread, sometimes I say to myself quietly, I do always remember. It's a, you're in, put yourself in the present tense, not just your baptism. And make that covenant again. And that's how you can use some of the Psalm of Nephi. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip some other things, but I love the way the Psalm of Nephi lets me understand and confront the idea of sin and sinfulness and of despair and a firm hope, hope in Christ. Some years ago, I wrote a couple of songs based on the Psalm of Nephi. Uh, we've sung one of them, which is that, uh, I love the Lord. Some of you may know it to the tune of Finlandia. In him my soul delights. I'm going to have Dan Henderson, in conclusion, sing another one I wrote. It's to a tune that was a, it's a folk tune. And, um, and it goes like this. The tune is the poor wayfaring stranger. Sometimes my soul in deep affliction cries out, O oh, wretched man am I. When I'm encompassed by temptation, when flesh is weak and I comply. Yet still I know in whom I've trusted. He's heard my cries by day and night. He's filled my heart with love consuming. He's borne my soul to mountain height. Then why in sorrow should I linger? My strength grow slack and my heart groan. I'll not give way to grief or anger, for God's great mercy have I known. Awake, my soul, and cease from drooping. Rejoice, my heart, and praise thy God, who is the rock of my salvation. I'll strictly walk, grasping his rod. I know, brothers and sisters, that our hope in Christ is sure. It is what the scriptures call based on an immutable promise and a covenant that God will forgive and will, will heal our infirmities. I know that this promise is immutable because it's been written in blood, the blood of our Savior. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Sometimes my soul in deep affliction cries out, O wretched man am I when I'm encompassed by temptation. When flesh is weak and I comply, yet still I know in whom I've trusted, he's heard my cries by day and night, he's filled my heart with love consuming he's borne my soul to mountain height then why in sorrow should I linger? My strength grows slack and my heart grown. I'll not give way to grief or anger for God's great mercy. Have I known? Awake, my soul, and cease from drooping. Rejoice, my heart, and praise thy God, who is the rock of my salvation. I'll strictly walk, grasping his rod. Awake, my soul, and cease from drooping. Rejoice, my heart, and praise thy God. Awake, my soul. Rejoice, my heart, rejoice, my heart, rejoice, my heart, and praise the